So we are going to get started with the introduction. So remember just with the syllabus, the whole sign, design of the course, everything that's written on these PowerPoints said by me in lecture, seen on the video, written in your book, talked about by a guest lecturer, said by your colleagues in class discussion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's fair game for our quizzes and our tests. It's primarily going to be this that uh, you need to be worried about just a heads up on that, but everything is fair game. So if you pay attention to what we discuss in class, if you take notes, it, I'm, if, you're, if you're conscious uh, during our time together, you, you, you're probably not going to have anything to worry about. So what is politics? What are we looking at? What are we talking about? Oh, before we get there. Note on the email, again, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. I wouldn't be emphasizing this as much if it wasn't as big a problem as it is. J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, period, Parker, at ICC.edu. I know, but it is a, a big problem. Send your email to the correct address. My name is spelled correctly all over. Look at it. And... Look at this, the slide, look at your syllabus, look at Canvas. I mean, there there is no excuse not to be able to spell my name correctly. All right, so what is politics? What is the nature of, of what we're looking at? So the generic definition, and I just really I pulled this out of Merriam-Webster, the art or science concerned with guiding or influencing governmental policy. And just another heads up. Um, the stuff that's kind of differentiated, you know, and, and this, you'll notice this is in bold red. Uh, that's a clue that, uh, you know, this probably will make it onto a test. Uh, not everything we talk about will make it onto a test. Uh, I pull the more important stuff, you know, and I will let you know what that is. Students, especially during the summer, often complain, uh, but I, I just don't understand if everything we went over and everything that was said and everything on all the slides and in the, all the textbook made it on to an exam. I mean, the exam would be hundreds of questions long and, I mean, would take a long time to complete. So uh, I don't know what to tell you there. But politics, the art or science concerned with guiding or influencing governmental policy. That's it. That's the definition of politics we're going to go with for this class. All right? So what is this? What are we talking about? Somebody's political leanings. Say I'm a Republican. All right, I'm talking to a Democrat. The Democrat says to me, your politics disgust me. What are they talking about? Maybe, uh, and I'm I'm just giving an example. I'm I'm not. I, my aim in this class is just not to say what I am. Um, the uh, maybe if a Republican, just generic, maybe a right to life, and the Democrats pro-choice. All right, maybe the Democrat says your politics disgust me, and they're referring to that um, policies. Policies. I alluded to this before. I just am speaking very generically just to get a point across. You know, P Republicans only want tax cuts to help their rich donors. Policies. Okay, that's governmental policy. Republicans might get into power in the House and Senate. They might pass uh, tax cuts to help billionaires, just very generically speaking. Party politics. Um, Frank got 54% of the vote at the convention and became chairman of the Republican Party. All right, Frank somehow convinced more than half of the delegates at the convention to make him the guy that's in charge. So politics, again, this word's bolded and in red, so I might remember it or write it down or do something. 
Politics is a multifaceted word that can be applied to any number of situations. It can penetrate almost any aspect of life. You might be your parents' favorite child and know you're your parents' favorite child. You might um, know uh, that your boss doesn't like you. You know, there could be workplace politics. Your coworker could get a raise and you don't. Okay, maybe that's politics after a fashion. Uh, why did your work coworker get the raise and you didn't? So American political culture, not exactly what you're thinking before I reveal what it is. It's a system of shared political traditions, customs, beliefs in institutions, and values. So our political traditions, do you go vote? Uh, customs, uh, we stand for the pledge, maybe. Beliefs and institutions, do we still trust the Supreme Court? After the leak of the draft opinion of Roe v. Wade, is that still something we do? And there are core principles to political culture. Liberty being one. The right to be free as long as another's rights are not harmed. Put it another way, my right to swing my fist ends where somebody else's nose begins. All right? I have a right not to be hit. Somebody has a right to swing their fist. The fist cannot collide with my face or my rights would be harmed. My right to be left alone. My right not to uh, get beat up. You know, there are a lot of rights. Equality. And this is an important one. It's a very, very important one because equality gets confused with equity. All right? People have the same or similar opportunities to compete and achieve. But this does not guarantee the same results. Say, um, I'm sitting here in a coffee house right now. Say, this coffee house in my hometown has an opening for a managerial position. I put my application in, 30 other people put their application in. Um, everybody in an ideal world, and you'll learn over the next uh, seven weeks now with me, you know, that where how things are and how things ought to be. It's the difference, uh, you know, it's it's the distance from, from here to Mars. It really is. But in an ideal world, you know, all 31 of us would have our resumes looked at equally. All 31 of us would be interviewed and the best person would be selected for the position, ideally. I know that's not how it works. Um but ideally speaking. So we had the same opportunity to apply for that managerial position, but we can't have 31 managers. Those are too, uh, too many, you know, too many chiefs and uh, not enough Indians, proverbially speaking. So people who go choose to go to law school usually become richer than those who drop out of high school. Now we all have the same opportunity for a high school education, um, many of us, I mean, uh, try to do well, uh, try to get good grades because we want to go on to college. There are those, though, that don't try in high school, just show up. Uh, maybe they don't graduate. So, you know, maybe they get a lower paying job, maybe... There's another person that goes and graduates college and goes on to law school and gets their Juris Doctor and becomes a practicing lawyer and make a lot of money. There was a similar opportunity there to go to high school and, and do the work and get decent grades. The person, one person chose to do that, the other didn't. And democracy, a government run by the people through elected representatives. Now, there's a legitimate argument to be made whether or not the United States is still a democracy. That's not for me to say. That's for you to decide. So, trust in government. Uh, these polls aren't done really frequently, but they, they updated a poll. Pew um, is a very reputable research firm, uh, as is Gallup. I pull from these two a lot. I can't show you. Uh, on the screen, unfortunately, what this is because YouTube would then flag me for copyright infringement and my account would be flagged. Uh, so 
I, I leave it to you. Look at this. Take a look at this. Uh, it's good stuff. They updated in 2021. Um, trust in government is up, I, mean, I think, around 28%. It's a little up from the Trump years, but not by much at all. But look at this. I can't, uh, just throughout the semester, I can't click on links because of copyright infringement. YouTube is very um, strict about that, and I get, I've already been flagged once inadvertently. So, can't do it again. Um, so, when I do have these links, please look at them. I put them up for a solid reason, but I cannot show them on video. So what is the nature of U.S. politics? I ask this question a lot in my in-person classes. I get answers like combative or broken or um, oh, I had a word, it just escaped me, but uh, not good, not great. And that's a, a legitimate answer. So politics functions within government although they are not the same. Politics are very different thing than, than government. You can, believe it or not, have a government which is apolitical. People just come in to work, and uh, it's not Republican versus Democrat versus Libertarian versus Green. It's just for the good of the people. Again, the ideal world I'm talking about and the world we live in, way, way uh, different. So there are some who argue that politics is decisions made in an environment of conflict. And I think we can all agree that, um, you know, that is very much the case today. It is, <laughs> we are having decisions made that affect our lives in an environment of conflict. Uh, I'm thinking namely right now of the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate, uh, while others, including political scientist Harold Laswell, and don't worry about that. I, I will not ask you about the names of these people, hardly, when we get to, like, actually, like, who's the president, who's the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Those are names you'll have to remember, but am I going to ask you about Harold Laswell? No politics he says though the politics is who gets what when and how and these are both uh, decent definitions also as to what politics is government really which is unfortunately in our case a very political thing you know collects our tax dollars and redistributes them uh, in a in a manner that they choose and they choose who gets what who gets the tax dollars when they get the tax dollars, and how they receive that money. Or uh, if uh, benefits, you know, uh, food stamps, maybe. You know, who gets them? Okay, maybe you have to have a, under a certain level of um, income when that happens, maybe the first of the month, uh, how that happens. You know, it's, you can, there are a lot of examples that back uh, Mr. Laswell up. So these definitions, they're related in that they both involve conflict, and that is really the, the nature of politics, conflict. And, you know, I'm underlining, I'm circling, these things might be stuff you want to write down. Uh, and they share the notion that government decisions affect who is impacted and how. And this is entirely true. I don't think anybody can argue with this, that this is what government really is in our country. Is it how it should be? Is it how the Founding Fathers intended? No. But this is what we've got, folks. So let's move on. The notion that politics encompasses who gets what, when, and how, it captures the connection between politics and power. Now, who decides who gets what, when, and how? Well, maybe a United States senator has some pull. Maybe the governor of the state of Illinois has some pull also into in who gets what, when, and how. Maybe I go, uh, and I'm not, 
maybe I'm a friend of J.B. Pritzker, the current governor of Illinois, and maybe I say, hey, J.P., J.B., excuse me, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a little trouble paying my rent. Do you think, uh, you know, that there might be a way that we could get rent control in the state of Illinois? He says, sure, sure, Jonathan, I, I think that's a good idea. And maybe a bill gets passed through um, the state legislature saying, you know, rent cannot exceed X amount of dollars. Okay, I have some pull, I have some power. I just got the governor of Illinois to agree to a rent control bill. I I just pull examples just out of my head as they as they occur to me. I'm not this stuff doesn't happen. They're just examples. Um, who gets what says something about who has power. So from my example earlier. I have a little power because I went to the governor of Illinois. The governor of Illinois agreed with me and put a bill through the General Assembly. When one gets what one wants, says something about how important that individual or group is and just how much power the person or group has. So let's take it back to the federal level. Uh, the um, APAC, the American Israeli uh, Political Action Committee, uh, they are an immensely powerful group, immensely uh, if a senator or representative votes wrong, they have constituents lighting up the phone boards in their office before they even get back there ready to complain and tell that senator or representative why they voted wrong. Um, so that's power, too, in uh, PACs. How the power is obtained speaks to the strength of the individual groups involved. Now, st sticking with APAC, all right, they can light up phone boards just through calls to membership. You know, this senator just cast a vote that was anti-Israel. Um, we need to let him know uh, what we think about that. So in a political system where scarce resources are to be distributed, various groups will compete to determine who gets what, how much they get, and under what circumstances they get it. And there are scarce resources. There's, in spite of the uh, Federal Reserve and President Biden, you know, printing all this money, there, there is only a finite supply of money, or there should be. Uh, who gets it? How do they get it? What circumstances? Food. We might be facing, uh, depending on how things go in the Ukraine, we might be facing a, a food shortage here shortly. It's a scary thought, uh, but it's a reality. Um, you know, who gets food? Who gets fed? Do the government fat cats get fed before the average citizen? What happens? Is there a government food bank that will be set up? I'm again I'm just spitballing but these are considerations you know in a political system that we might have to I hope not but we might have to consider in the near term so this usually means that if one group derives benefits others bear costs so let's just say uh I mean they decide um that pregnant women should be a priority in getting fed and getting the nutrients they need to bring in the next generation. Um, all right, well, if pregnant women are getting fed, that means uh, maybe um, young men are not. I still consider myself young. I'm only 32. Um, so I'm not eating, but a pregnant woman is, and uh, that's probably the right decision. Uh, public policies are those laws that government makes within the context of a political process. So they make that policy that gets debated on the floor of the U.S. House, it gets debated on the floor of the U.S. Senate, it goes to President Biden who signs it, and that's, that's what it is. That's how it works. And we've touched on this, but you only really need to look at the opposing views that routinely occur in policy-making arenas like city councils, state legislatures, the U.S. Congress, to, to see this in action. Uh, like long ago, you know, uh, 
I, I, I don't know when you guys were born, but in the, uh, the Obama administration, there was a great, uh, deal of, of, uh, hullabaloo about health care. We, we got Obamacare. Um, those who were for it, who, those who were previously uninsured would be insured because the higher income people pay an additional tax. So poorer people get insurance. Higher income people bear the cost. They have to pay for that insurance or help pay for that insurance, rather, by paying additional tax. So patients, taxpayers, the insurance company, they're all affected differently. Um, the people who are involved in the conflict are considered actors because they're participating in it. Those who sit on the sidelines and observe are spectators. So considering the roles of actors and spectators in the political process means that politics becomes a mobilization of bias. Who can you get on your side? Who can you make believe you? So where the actors, the people involved, attempt to show spectators why they should care about and become actively involved with the conflict. So this way, actors can build a base of support for their case and achieve victory if they're able to mobilize enough people to join them, like uh, Obamacare. And efforts to reform immigration policy are also an example of a mobilization of bias. You have the pro-immigration, just let, let them in, pretty open borders. You have the anti-immigration uh, crowd also. So groups that seek to open the U.S. borders to more immigrants have brought non-immigrant groups to their side by showing how immigration divides families. You have Granny, who is taking care of her grandson in Arizona, and Mom and Dad are still in uh, Mexico, and isn't that a terrible thing? All right, we might be trying to mobilize bias on the side of um, lenient or more lenient immigration policies. So some who advocate stricter border patrol, they suggest that less restrictive immigration controls increase unemployment in various economic sectors such as agriculture and blue-collar labor. And a key factor in this understanding of politics is that resolution is achieved through peaceful means. And that's important to remember. Resolution is achieved through peaceful means. We may yell at each other, we may not like what each other has to say, but when conflict becomes violent, when the guns come out, when um, we start going at each other with weapons, you know, that's when politics fails. As long as we're talking, we're good. It's still politics. When we stop talking, the process has failed. And that's it for the introduction. Thanks for hanging in there.